Hola a todos, soy Javier Poveda y no sé cuánto va a durar este vídeo, pero esto sigue siendo de Bien TV, el canal donde te lo vas a pasar, bueno, este vídeo no lo sé, pero de normal, de bien, mientras aprendes geografía, historia, historia del arte y un poquito de economía y de empresariales. Este vídeo va para mis chicos de cuarto de la SOD, sección del CEIPS en Encinar de Torlodones. In this video, we are starting the unit 6, the first world war and the Russian revolution. This unit will have three parts and this is the first one which corresponds to the first world war, the longest part. So, let's hurry. The first world war and the Russian revolution, the first part, the first world war. We are going to start talking about the armed peace. So in Europe between 1870 and 1914, there was a period what, of what is known as the armed peace, la paz armada. It's called like this because there was peace, but there was a lot of tension between the European countries and it was growing and it will explode in 1914 with the war. In this period, these countries are going to dedicate a large part of their economic effort or production to manufacturing weapons. So first we have to talk about how this peace was kept, or was kept, perdón, uh, and it was, uh, they did so with the Bismarckian system between 1871 and 1890, after the unification of Germany in 1871, after the Franco-Prussian War. Um, Germany became the most important power in Europe because of its economic and military development. We have two phases in the German foreign policy. First, um, the one uh, um, within the reign of the Emperor Willem I, Guillermo I, which uh, used diplomacy to maintain the balance of power between the European countries, with the help of his Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, which established a system of alliances with the Austro-Hungarian Austro -Hungarian Empire, the Russian Empire and Italy, known as the Bismarckian Alliance System. They allied, he, well, or Germany allied with everybody except France. Why? Because the objective of these alliances were to maintain Germany hegemony in Europe and also to prevent France from declaring war on Germany because they wanted to recover the Alsace and Lorraine, this territory here in the border between these two countries, which France lost during the Franco-Prussian War in 1871. And with this policy, Bismarck managed to avoid conflict in Europe for 20 years. However, in, to do so, he had to strengthen the German army and this forced the other European countries to build up their armies too, and this is called the arms race, la carrera de armamentos. Okay, and here you have a diagram of all of these alliances, and the common point of all of these alliances is the isolation of France. Here you have this arms race, with all these battleships and this weapons factory and airplane factory and this uh, industry grew a lot during this period. The, and it was very, very significant in the uh, fleet arms race because uh, the Germans wanted to compete with the, ho the British home fleet. And this, uh, well, this is the HMS Dreadnought, which, which was one of the most powerful battleships of that time. In the second phase, we have uh, the next German Emperor, Willem II, who came to the throne in 1888 and changed the system of alliances for an expansionist policy, because he wanted to uh, raise the prestige of Germany and to obtain a colonial empire. Bismarck didn't want, uh, didn't like this policy, so he resigned in 1890. And this uh, political, this uh, policy, this foreign policy of William II, this guy here, caused concern in France and Great Britain, so they allied and they made an alliance between the two of them and the Russian Empire known as the Triple Entente, la Triple Entente de 1907, to stop the Germany expansion. Here we have the alliances prior to the start of the First World War. We have three main alliances. I mean, two main alliances. First, the triple alliance between the German Empire, Austria-Hungary and Italy. 
Remember, this is prior to the World War I because um, this will this won't be the countries that will fight in the World War because Italy will betray his allies. But we will see it later. And the Triple Entente, which is Russia, France and the United Kingdom. So let's go with the First World War. It is also called the Great War and it was fought between 1914 and 1918 by various European countries and also the African and Asian colonies, but also other countries from all over the world, such as the United States, Japan, China and other uh, countries, for example, the Latin American republics. And this is, this is why it is considered to be a world war, because it involved many countries from all over the world. First, the causes. We have several causes for the start of this war. First, the Balkan, um, well, the Balkan conflict, because both the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Russian Empire competed for the control of the Balkans, as well as the Ottoman Empire. At the same time, Serbia, which is this country here, was angry about the expansion of the Austro-Hungarian Empire into the area because they annexed Bosnia and Herzegovina in 1908. And the Serbians wanted to unite all the Slavs of the Balkans to form what later will be Yugoslavia. Also, France wanted to recover Alsace-Lorraine and they competed for the control of some colonies, for example, in Morocco. There was um, a conflict between the, Fran the French and the Germans, which almost led to a war. Then also Great Britain saw the supremacy of its merchant navy threatened when the German Empire constructed a large fleet of merchant ships in order to dominate international trade. We have said that the Germans, the, um, the German Empire with William II, wanted a colonial empire so they had to build, since the colonial empire is overseas, they had to build a large fleet, both merchant but also military fleet. And the Casus Belli, the start, the real start of the war, was the murder of or the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand in uh, on the um, 28th of June of 1914. He was the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and he was assassinated here in Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia Herzegovina, during a visit by a young Bosnian Serb nationalist, which uh, was called Gabrilo Princip, and the Austrian government blamed Serbia for this assassination and sent an ultimatum. And this ultimatum, which was uh, which impossible to accomplish by the Serbians, led to the declaration of war of the Austro-Hungarian Empire on Serbia one month later, on the 28th of July. After this, all these alliances were activated, so the First World War started. Well, here we have the conflict of Morocco. Morocco finally was divided into protectorates, the Spanish on the north and the south, and the French in the center. But uh, William II wanted, uh, wanted his own German protectorate in Morocco, and that's why, for example, he visited Tangiers in 1905. He's here, here, this is William II. And the casus belli, the, the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, this is him with his wife. And this is a few minutes before the assassination because when, when uh, they were traveling on this car, they were shot by this guy, Gabriel Princip, and both of them were killed. Boom, murder, and the war starts. Who were the belligerents? We have the Allied powers on one side and the Central powers in the other side. The Central powers were Germany, Austria-Hungary, and later the Ottoman Empire, who joined the war in the, on December 1914, and Bulgaria in 1915. On the other side, we have the Allied powers, the Triple Entente, British Empire, the French Republic, and uh, the Russian Empire, of course, Serbia, who was the country 
invaded and then other countries such as Belgium who will be invaded by the Germans uh, Italy who changed sides they didn't uh, they didn't join the war on the central powers side but on the allied power side because they were promised many territories in Europe also the Greeks the Romanians and the most important well, Japan in the Pacific, and maybe the most important belligerent who decided the war, the United States in 1917. In Europe, this is um, this is the map of the belligerents. In pink, the Central Powers, Germany, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire, not Turkey, and later Bulgaria. And in the in this uh, brown or I don't know what color is this France, England, Italy, Serbia, Romania, uh, Russia, Greece, and Portugal, and many other countries Montenegro, Luxembourg, blah blah blah. But these are the ones with the dates, the most important ones. So first, well, this war has several phases. The first one are the initial German offensive offensives of 1914. Germany, in this phase, they put the Schlieffen plan into effect. Schlieffen was a German general who uh, had this idea of a uh, 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 German invasion of France. This consisted of launching a rapid offensive on the Western Front in the German-French uh, border, invading Belgium here, which was a neutral country and which caused the intervention of Great Britain, and the north of France with the aim of reaching Paris. Why they took this way? Because the most of the French army was here in the French border, in the, in the German border, I mean. And once France was defeated, was, which was the main uh, enemy, the German troops would advance on the Eastern Front to fight the Russians, which were considered to be weaker. And this German plan did not succeed because the French and British armies, the British were, were, had already landed in Europe, stopped their advance in the first battle of the Marne. The miracle of the Marne, the Marne River is this one here, okay, it's a tributary of the Seine, and they were stopped there. And at the same time, the Russians invaded the eastern part of Germany, West Prussia, but they were defeated by the Germans in the Battle of Tannenberg, which is a very important victory for the Germans, and at the same time, the Japanese occupied the German colonies in the Pacific, Pacific Ocean and China. So, these are the German troops coming to the Western Front, very happy, their happiness will not last a lot. These are German troops and French troops advancing. The Germans are easily recognized because of this Pickelhause or this uh, helmet with this spike at the top. And this is what happened. The French advanced on the German border and the Germans invaded. Uh, Belgium and tried to advance to northern France and they managed to do so but they were stopped here next to the river Marne okay almost I think this is around 30 kilometers or 40 or 50 kilometers a very short distance from Paris the French capital and later they had to retreat and this front here will be stabilized and we will see that in the next phase a ver and meanwhile in the western in the eastern front the russians these blue arrows they invaded east prussia and the germans had very little troops here but um, they managed to accomplish this victory in tannenberg they were led by the marshal hindenburg and japan conquered all the german colonies in uh, Asia, these ports here, the port of Qingdao and the Marianas, the Marshall Islands, the Caroline Andals and the German New Guinea. This next, um, the next phase is the trench warfare, la guerra de trincheras. So the western front between Germany and the Allies stabilized and since they could not advance, both sides focused on defending their positions and they do so by building trenches, which are ditches in the ground, zanjas en la tierra 
from where they could defend themselves using new weapons such as machine guns, heavy artillery, tanks, poison guns and flamethrowers. This is a British trench, a ditch in the ground since in which they can cover from the enemy fire. To break this western front, they were uh, they tried well both of the sides tried to break the front by usually by continually attacking the same place for example in verdun in the battle of verdun by germany and the battle of the somme by great britain both of them failed and also in addition they used battleships and submarines the main uh, naval battle of the first world war was the battle of Juldan, in which the british fleet fought the german fleet and it is considered to be a tie and not a british um, victory as the book says Bleh. this is trench warfare a lot of ditches in the ground which were usually communicated one with each other like uh, urban planning Okay, and this is no man's land with uh, barbed wire and mines and we also can find uh, bunkers or, or machine gun pits or well and behind the trenches we have the long range artillery and this uh, this warfare lasted for most of the war here you have examples of German trenches and British trenches and they fire from here from these holes in the in the um, in the trenches or just climbing up them and as you can see there there be they built a lot but a lot but boof, a lot of trenches and look at this map and this plan and this aerial photograph and and this is the area between both trenches no man's land la tierra de nadie the new weapons that were proved and they were tested here in this war and these modern weapons that uh, are usually used in in modern warfare are the machine guns and the howitzers los obuses this uh, long caliber uh, great caliber artillery the tanks the flamethrowers the poison gas they had to wear this gas mask in order to to survive the um, aerial warfare these airplanes the war airplanes and these are the battles of verdun and some in which they tried to break the front and they were not successful in the year 1970 there are two main events that happened and first the united states joined the war in the side of the allies because they were affected by the german submarine warfare that had sunk very um, a lot of neutral merchant ships many of them american that were uh, trading with great britain so they joined um, the war in the allies and their contribution was uh, very important and also in the same year their um their no, they're not. Well, a political and social revolution in the Russian Empire, the Russian Revolution, both of them, the February and the October revolutions, which we'll, we will study later in the next video, caused Russia to withdraw from the war after signing the Peace of Brest-Litovsk by the Bolshevik. Bolshevik. So, the Germans could focus on the Western Front, yet it was not um, enough to stop the American troops. This is the sinking of the RMS Lusitania, which was caused a lot of impact in the American press. And this is the, the exclusion zone that the Germany declared around Great Britain. They sank any ship that entered this zone. This is the signing of the Treaty of the Brest-Litovsk between the Central Powers and the Soviet Russia, because the Bolsheviks were, were already in, in power, in 1918 after the armistice, with armistice that was signed in the previous year. The Germans had advanced, well, the Central Powers, mostly the Germans, had advanced all of this, okay, in the, into the heart of the Russian Empire. And finally, the end of the war and the armistice in 1918. With the help of the American troops and weapons, the Allied forces managed to advance on the Western Front after the Second Battle of the Marne. And the exhaustion and an ever-increasing lack of resources, mostly food, 
and drove the central powers to seek peace. The Kaiser William II abdicated and on the uh, November 11th of 1918, the armistice was signed in Compiègne. These are uh, American soldiers fighting in the Great War. This is the armistice in the forest of Compiègne in, in this in this train wagon and the news in the in the newspapers in the new york times and then the war ended the economy and the society during the war discount all the countries involved established a war economy so to focus all or to redirect all the, the economic efforts towards the war industry. So the industrial sector concentrated on the production of military equipment and supplies, weapons, cannon, planes, uniforms, ammunition, etc. The agricultural and consumer goods production decreased. Why? Because there weren't enough laborers. They were conscripted in the army. As a consequence, they, there were shortages, o sea, escasez, of some products and the prices increased, the law of demand and supply, as you know. The governments intervened to control the distributions of basic goods and food, such as bread and potatoes, so the rationing was introduced, el racionamiento, which means that people received ration cards that could be used to obtain rationed goods. So you couldn't buy freely, but you, you only could get the amount of food that you were assigned. At the same time, the black market developed, as it is obvious. Since most, mo most young men were conscripted, they were called to the army or recruited into the armed force, women had to leave the home to fill the positions the men had left. As we will see here, here we have women workers in the munitions factory in the United Kingdom and here in another gun factory in London. And they, uh, they also had to work in the rural areas in agriculture. Here they are pulling, um, they are trolling um, lo diré, a plow. And these are ration cards or ration books. Okay, you, uh, you went to the butcher or, or, or whoever um, gave away the food and they sealed your rationing card here. As you can see, pin, 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 a bit of butter, a bit of sugar, a bit of bread or whatever. This is a British one and this is a German one with the lines of poor people, of starving people waiting for their, uh, their ration of every day. So after the armistice, the peace has to be settled. So in January 1919, the representatives of the victorious countries met at the Paris Peace Conference, which lasted until the next year, 1920, to decide on the peace conditions that would be imposed on the defeated countries. The president of the United States, Woodrow Wilson, this guy here, um, had proposed a peace agreement during the war, and it was called the 14 Points. And some of them were, the, um, they, he, um, he tried to establish a League of Nations, which is the, um, the previous organism before the United Nations in, that were uh, created in 1945, the establishment of democratic states, the freedom of trade, and the respect for a nation's right to self-determination, el derecho de autodeterminación. This plan was rejected by the Allied countries, France, Britain, and Italy, and mostly by France, because they or she insisted on considering Germany to be responsible for the war and wanted it to pay for the damage it had caused, because as you know, they were enemies since the Franco-Prussian War. And after long negotiations, in which the defeated countries were not involved, they were not invited to them, so there was, it was an agreement only between the victorious countries, the Paris Peace Settlement was agreed on these two years, 1919 and 1920. This is a fragment of the 14 points of Woodrow Wilson, if you, like to re if you would like to read it. So, there were five separate treaties signed with each one of the central powers. Uh, and they uh, and each one of them signed a different countries uh, a different treaty and they are named after the room in the 
palace of Versailles in which they were signed. The most, well, these are one, Versailles with Germany, Saint Germain in Ley with Austria, Trianon with Hungary, they were separated, Neuilly with Bulgaria and Sèvres with the Ottoman Empire. The most important one of these five was the Treaty of Versailles between Germany and the Allied powers, in which they established particularly, well, not particularly, very, very severe and humiliating conditions or terms for Germany. The prohibition of heavy artillery, planes and submarines, and also their army was limited to 100,000 soldiers. The payment of huge economic reparations. The last uh, part of these economic reparations was paid, uh, I think, 10 or 15 years ago by Angela Merkel. The reduction of its territories, we will see that in the maps later, and the demilitarization of the region which is next to France, the Rhineland, La Renania, which is next to the French border. This is the signing in this picture of this treaty, in the Hall of Mirrors. We have... Ooh, Sorry, WhatsApp. This is, well, and also uh, the social and economic consequences. Of course, the decrease on population, because there were tens of millions of victims of the war and millions of injured, mutilated or disappeared. The destruction of the cities, but not only the cities, the houses, the transport networks, the factories and the agricultural land, which caused a negative impact on the economies of these countries. They had to wait several years to recover the levels of production of the of uh, prior to the war. The incorporation of the women in the workplace, they, as we, we have seen, they had to join the workforce in the factories to collaborate with the war effort. And when the men came back after the war, the women did not accept their return to their traditional roles after the war. However, they had to do so once the fighting was over, because there were not enough jobs. But this was the start of the suffragist, um, well, the suffragist was, um, had, uh, well, already existed, but this encouraged the women to fight for their rights. And finally, the loss of Europe's economic power due to the material losses and the loans from the United States during the war. The United States replaced the Great Britain and France and Germany as the leading economic power in the world. These are the number of deaths in World War I. As you can see there, the total number of military and civilian casualties in World War I was more than 41 million. This is a huge number and it was never, it wasn't, well, uh, in the previous wars, in all the history, there has uh, there were never such a big number or a high number of deaths uh, but they were surpassed in the world war second but uh, we will study that in later units the military cemeteries this is the cemetery of the soldiers that fall uh, that were killed in the battle of Verdun in 1916 this is a comparison between the gdp what what we call the El PIB, El Producto Interior Bruto, this is the gross development product, the richness of a country with a base 100 here. As you can see, France, after a war, had a 65% of the richness it has on 1913. But, for example, the United States and the UK, which territory was not affected by the war, their economy grew. And the main territorial consequences of this a peace settlement of Paris were the following. First, after the collapse of the Russian Empire and the establishment of the, the, the Bolshevik Russia and later the Soviet Union, many countries um, gained independence. Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania and Poland from the Russian Empire. And Germany lost also many territories part of the northern part of Sle the Duchy of Slevig to Denmark, many of its western territories to Poland, okay, they split their territory in two, and this was one of the main causes of the, of the start of the Second World War, and of course the return of Alsace-Lorraine to France. Austria-Hungary was divided, the empire 
was destroyed and it was divided into countries, Austria and Hungary, which became republics and also other uh, territories gained independence. Czechoslovakia, some parts came uh, were given to the newly Republic of Poland, the Transylvania area to Romania and most of its southern territories to the newly formed Yugoslavia. Um, which were which were the oh, well which nucleus was the Serbian Republic and for the Italians okay the Italians joined the war in the Allied side because they wanted all these territories from the Austria-Hungary Empire and uh, well I don't know why this is repeated by the Russian Empire collapse and entered a civil war which was won in 1922 by the Bolsheviks and the USSR was created we have already seen these new states created in the western part mainly Poland with this corridor here the Danzig corridor which split the German uh, Republic territory into and also Bulgaria lost these parts of territory and the formation of Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia in the in uh, the former Austro Austro Hungarian uh, territory. Also, the Ottoman Empire came to an end, replaced by the Republic of Turkey, the modern Republic of Turkey, and these uh, well, these countries were not. Um, were not created, but they were mandates of uh, that were given by the uh, Society of Nations, by the League of Nations, I mean, to the French and the British. And this is how the map of Europe remained after the World War I. These are the new borders, the red ones, okay, with these new countries. And this is the map we will encounter when we study the Second World War. And this is the end. This is the Verdun field battlefield in which you can see the craters caused by the bombs. So, 31 minutazos. Pues yo pensaba yo pensaba yo que iba a hacerlo mucho más, que iba a tardar mucho más. Así que bueno, ya os he dicho que esta es la parte más complicada de este tema 6. Pero bueno, la hemos solventado con éxito. En, eh, en próximos vídeos, que nos quedan dos, veremos la Revolución Rusa, fantástico tema, y la Restauración Borbónica en España, un tema no tan fantástico. Ya sabéis que para cualquier cosa me podéis escribir o al correo o a la virtual, o seguirme en Instagram, cdfdaisy, o seguirme en Twitch los domingos, que sé que esto no lo hacéis, pero me da igual, en twitch.tv de Bienstream. Espero que este vídeo os haya ayudado para entender el tema y, como siempre, muchas gracias por estar ahí. Y verlo. Nos vemos en el próximo.